Let me uh, introduce our next speaker, um, Eva Fedida. Uh, Eve was born in uh, Alexandria in 1945, and like uh, Juliet, he was expelled in 56. Um, he went to, uh, to Paris and then to London, and he now lives in uh, between uh, southern France and the UK. Um, Yves is the uh, co-founder of the Association Internationale Nebi uh, Daniel, and it's a website that focuses on Egyptian Jewish heritage, dealing with a wealth of information of the history, community registers, documents, and artifacts, as well as ongoing projects. Uh, please welcome Eve. Um, well, hello everyone across the globe, and uh, thank you to Tempo Bet Am and the organizers, uh, Etta Gold, Yoram Milman, Professor Green, and Andrea Levine, for inviting me to their Sunday salon. Rest assured, this salon is neither about beauty nor about my hairstyle, but it's about what I do best, kvetching. So allow me then to talk about the ongoing injustice done to the Jews of Egypt and to their descendants. This concerns their records and archives. These records and archives of the Jewish community reflect the history and diversity of an open and unique multi-ethnic, multi-origin, multinational Mediterranean society. And I explain to you that origin of all these people. We had Mughrabi Jews, Mizrahi Jews, Romanyot Jews, Sephardi Jews, Ashkenazim Jews, Indian Jews, etc. They are a source and uh, some would say a unique source for legal, uh, civil and religious identity documentation, which are critical for many people even to this day. They contain therefore family histories and genealogies. They go back to 1830 in the case of Alexandra and probably 30 years earlier in the case of Cairo. This complete and detailed collection for Jews from Arab countries is also unique among Mediterranean Jewish communities because of the legal framework from which it was born, that is the millet system, but also because other Mediterranean societies' documents have disappeared. I'm thinking about Salonika or Izmir, which were very important communities. The community in Egypt has now disappeared. Exclusions from work, mass arbitrary imprisonment, harassment, confiscation of property, nationalization of businesses, expulsions, national anti-Jewish policies, have taken their toll on the 80 to 100,000 Jews. There are now, I think, just about five, and as says 20, I think it's probably closer to five Jews left. Now, up to April 2016, the records were located in the rabbinic court of the community, but we were not allowed to copy them. Let me show you the rabbinic court. I'm going to share my screen. These are the rabbinic court uh, pictures of um, uh, Alexandria. Uh, you can see uh, written here, Eta Civil, which is, just means civil registration. You can see here publication of the bans for weddings. You can see uh, the actual inside of the rabbinic court in Alexandria. And this is the entrance to the rabbinic court of Cairo. The court was, as you, can, as you saw, an actual physical entity which was separate from the synagogues. It worked on the model of any civil registry office and the property and content of the buildings in which the courts were located are unequivocally those of the communities. Very, very unfortunately, the so-called presidents of the two communities gifted these precious records to the National Archives, exclusively out of their own volition. This occurred in April 2016. Now you can ask under what or whose authority did they do this? Well, if we go by the community statutes, they were neither, they were not legally elected. 
and only a rabbinic authority could divest itself of these records. And in fact, Egypt itself forced out the last chief rabbis of Egypt and of Alexandria in 1967 after arresting them. And no one consulted any rabbinic authority abroad about this. Now, since the officially published historic statutes of the community were known to the government, the election of the presidents can be looked on as an anointment process. The government certainly took advantage of their evident lack of knowledge and vested on these presidents such authority as they could not legally have. It appropriated from them something they did not own, nor could they understand that they did not own it. Now, maybe I've been reading too many conspiracy theories lately, but you must realize that this occurred 44 years after the last chief rabbi left Egypt, 13 years after the last rabbi left Egypt, 11 years after the last non-converted Jewish male member of the community died, but a mere couple of weeks after our international petition to President Sisi on this matter, which gathered 2000 signatures and had become public. So over the past 18 years, my association with the constant help and advice of various Jewish institutions, such as the American Jewish Committee, the CRIF, the British Board of Deputies, the Consistoire, French Chief Rabbis, has repeatedly engaged the Egyptian government at all levels for the pres preservation of the Jewish heritage. We have failed to convince them to transfer a mere copy of the religious and civil identity records to a legal entity, such as the one they were created for, namely a rabbinic court. This is a register structure that you can see uh, uh, here, where we, we've in, we were able to index the registers of Alexandria. We were not allowed anywhere near those of Cairo. But those of Alexandria have been indexed, and we know that there were 15 circumcision uh, uh, records of, of, of which, uh, registers of which one was an index. Births and marriages, engagements, marriages, divorces, the deaths. Uh, there were records for the city of Tanta, which was under the jurisdiction of Alexandria. Records of conversion, of bar mitzvahs, of weddings, um, uh, donations for destitute girls rabbinical rulings, and here you must remember, because of its multicultural uh, uh, makeup and the cosmopolitan society that Jews lived in, rabbinical rulings took on a very light orthodox uh, um, uh, aspect. We have affidavits for celibacy and general affidavits, or civil status affidavits. Altogether, we reckon that there is double that amount, that is 120,000 pages at least, and there are probably about 600 registers and probably over 30 indexes to these registers which are available. For instance, th these are the, the, the indexes of, of the death registers in Alexandria. You see, they begin in 64, 1864, and they have not been closed, obviously, because after 49, they were still open. These are indexes of affidavits for uh, celibacy or for births and marriages. And you can see that this one starts in 1831. Um, they end, obviously, uh, this one in 1975. We were actually able to um, index, uh, sorry, to, 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 to put into form one of the uh, records, which was at the JNUL, the Jewish University, uh, Jerusalem University archives in uh, in uh, in Jerusalem, and it was the the personal records of Rabbi Prato in Alexandria. So, to show you a little bit what these records look like, these are these are pictures I, I was able to take when the records were in Alexandria. And you can see pictures of the uh, affidavit registers. These are actual registers, various different registers. You can see here Ketubot. 
You can see here bar mitzvah registers. This is one of the bookshelves with a, quite a variety of, of, of books and registers. Uh, the indexes here, more affidavits. These are very old ketubots, um, but I mean, they're, they're basically old. You can, as you can see, they go back to 1877. And uh, ketubots were kept in, in the community for safeguarding. Um, so there you go, more registers. Now, what's in the, reg what's in the indexes, for instance, example? We have a, a, an example of the, of, uh, the Cairo, of the Cairo index. Um, this refers, this gives you the name of the person, what he request, what was given to him in terms of uh, uh, register, uh, uh, in terms of certification, where it was, uh, the number of the, of the process and, and the date of the process. Um, this is a, a, a register, a death, uh, a register of, um, of deaths index. Um, and you can see again, excuse me, you can see again the name, the person, and the columns that you don't see on the right are the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the place he was buried, uh, the place the person was buried, and, uh, and the cemetery he was buried in. We were able to uh, have, we were fortunate to be able to have a, a, a Mohel book outside of Egypt. Uh, um, oh, there is a copy of it in Egypt, but we were able to have that Mohel book outside of Egypt. And the Mohel book here starts in 1928. It's a Mohel book of uh, uh, Mohel Dabi. Um, and there are many such Mohel books in Egypt. Obviously, one can index such Mohel books like this. This is the, fir the, the first page of a Mohel book which we indexed. And interestingly enough, unlike most Ashkenazi Mohel books, this one contains not only the mother's first name, but the mother's father's first name and the mother's maiden name. Um, so uh, it's, it's a, a little bit more, uh, although you know one tends to think that Sefardim um, neglect their women, this is more respectful of women than I would say Ashkenazim. Now, the records were handwritten entries. And this is, for instance, a handwritten entry of a wedding in 1904 and a wedding in 1941, respectively. On the right, you have the modern square, square script. On the left, you have the Hatsi Kulmus, which is an oriental script. It shows you that it's very difficult for anyone including rabbis, to, to be able to read these uh, scripts. So um, we have entries, for instance, of a divorce settlement with a cursive strip, script as well. So here, here you've seen some um, examples that could be um, uh, 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 of interest. Um, the, the, the importance of, of the records and the origin of the records uh, rather, um, is interesting. The, the origin is basically inspired by the Quran. The Ottoman military system, which was inspired by the Quran, remained in force until January 1956 in Egypt, despite independence from the Ottoman Empire 40 years earlier. Now, for Jews, this conferred on a rabbinic court in the main cities the exclusive authority to register to define and to oversee one's status, both civil and religious, vis-a-vis -vis the authorities in Egypt, the rabbinic authorities abroad, and even foreign authorities through their consulates. And I will show you some examples here. So the detailed examples are, for instance, like uh, here. Just for a second. Okay. Uh, this is just to, to, to show you uh, what existed prior to the Egyptian registration system. Um, namely, it was a, a, a municipality registration, um, and mostly from the, as you see, the medical services of the municipality. It indicated the name of the person, obviously, his date of birth, his name, and that's it. The same certificate uh, given by the community 
showed that this guy was actually Jewish uh, and, and uh, his circumcision and, and where he was registered. We have uh, registers which also took into account uh, births abroad. In other words, this guy, Haim, uh, sorry, this guy was, I, I've taken away the names because I, we don't want to have any problems. This guy was born in Damascus, in Syria, and yet this is a birth certificate for him, after the naissance. So the, the community was, a, was delivered birth certificates even for people who were not born in Egypt. Going back in time, this is an example of a birth certificate from the Ashkenazi synagogue, Ashkenazi community. Now, the Ashkenazi community existed on its own in the late 19th century, but it was merged in with the larger community, which was the Sephardi majority community. And therefore, these are fairly rare documents um, from the Ashkenazi community. Here you see it, documents, for instance, for, the, um, for the, uh, an affidavit. This was a preparation for a wedding showing that the person was going to get married and that he was a celibate. And again, the, the information in, enclosed in these documents is really very, very banal. It's very uh, common. It's what you would find in a normal registry office. Nowhere, and, and it contains nothing which can be even um, get, get close to, to, to containing a property, a property information or information about um, patrimony. These are examples of Ketubot from Cairo and Alexandria. And interestingly, the registers were also used to comfort foreign consulate. For instance, this is a transcription of a wedding, of, an, of, of a Jewish wedding in Cairo in 1950 that was transcribed into, uh, to the, to, to, by the French consul. Um, and it's, it's basically, it says, it gives you the content of the ketubah written in French, uh, including, you know, the, the amount of the, 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 of the, of the dot, uh, the, the amount of the dowry, and, and what it, the man can do, what he can't do, and so on. So the ketubah was transcribed for the civil serv ser service of, of the French reg registration and other uh, consuls as well. Here you see a, a, a death certificate by the municipality, which tells you that the guy was, you know, died and, and who he was, when, when he died and so on. And the same certificate for the same person tells you not only where he died, but it tells you where he is buried. And this is very important. It tells you here, for instance, that he was, he was 70 years old and he died on the 6th of Kislev and he is buried in cemetery number one, Kiss number six, row 18 to number 23. <coughs> you can see doc, uh, the, the, these kind of documents where registration was paid for. In other words, you went to the community to say, look, I, my, I'm getting married or my son was born and so on, and you paid for, these doc, for, for this entry. That is proven here by this mention of quittance and the, num and the amount which was perceived, which was taken in by the community. In that case, it was 30 pastors. This is an interesting one, uh, just to show you a, a certificate, an affidavit, and it says that Claudette Gateno is <coughs> of good conduct and is member of no political party. And this is normal because this is, we're not, talking about 1960, where being a member of a political party for a Jew could have been a, a dangerous situation. Another one, another certificate was given to a foreign authority. This is to say that this lady uh, uh, is, is, has, um, is, is, has come before us and asked to be uh, certified that she is not married and that, that uh, she, because she wants to get married. Again, in 1960, visibly the person was leaving. Same thing here. 
the, 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 the lady is going to be leaving and she wants to, 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 to confirm that she is not married. Well, these um, entries were paid for, were an important part of the resources for the communities. And again, there is a notion of property right that has to be taken into account in, in our discussion. The documents are essential even now for inheritance, orthodox marriages, retirement pensions, nationality applications, whether you want to be Spanish or Portuguese because your ancestors came from there, you need to have to resort to documents which were held by the community. They're also important for property rights on land in Israel. In the 1930s and 1940s, we had Shaliyah come to Egypt uh, to collect funds to purchase land in Israel. Uh, the Jews were so afraid uh, of being connected with Israel and, and with land in Israel that they hid this information even from their family. And we now have plots of lands in Israel which are heirless because nobody knows who the heirs are to, this, to these families. They're also very useful in locating tombs in the cemeteries. And they're essential civil status reference for people who were born in Egypt. Now, you must understand that only 25% of Jews from Egypt held an Egyptian nationality. Uh, about 40% were considered local or stateless. That's because the spirit of the nationality laws in 1926 and 29 had a racial connotation. And I can quote Article 10 and Paragraph 4 of that law, which says that were considered Egyptians, children born in Egypt of a foreign father, himself born in Egypt, if this foreigner is attached by race to the majority of the population of an Arab speaking or Muslim country. It was very difficult to prove that, and only 25% of Jews in Egypt managed to do that. So today, we have a situation where the government of Egypt has seized and withholds the religious and civil identity of Jews not born on its soil, born on its soil but foreign nationals, born on its soil and Egyptian nationals, subsequently denaturalized. The Egyptian nationality uh, or civil registration uh, the repository called Segel el Madani or uh, Dar el Mahfuzat. Its existence starts with the independence of Egypt in 1922. But it attests only to the civil identity of these 25% of Jews before their nationality was revoked. It does not attest to the religious status of the Jewish community as a whole, nor to the civil status of anyone predating 1922. Now, over the years, we've tried to explain our position in personal meetings in Cairo with one presidential councillor, one minister of foreign affairs, two ministers of culture, three ministers of antiquities, several high level representatives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the US, UK, French ambassadors in Cairo. In France, we talked to four Egyptian ambassadors and UNESCO ambassadors. We've sent numerous letters and emails to the same and more. We've submitted three pleas to President Mubarak and Sisi, including one sent by the Chief Rabbi of France. We launched, as I indicated, an international petition addressed to President Sisi with confirmation to eight Egyptian ambassadors across the world. We enlisted the help and goodwill of well-connected Egyptians. They were unsuccessful and even questioned and threatened for meddling. We presented our case to UNESCO General Director. We informed the presidents of France, Mr. Chirac, Mr. Sarkozy, with the help of the CRIF. We regularly engaged the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the French Minister of Culture. We solicited the president of Israel's help, Mr. Sh the late Shimon Peres, etc., etc. There has been a disdainful silence in return. This shows interaction of uh, this is Andrew Baker of the American Jewish Committee, 
uh, Roger Bilbul, co-founder of our association, and Zahi Hawass, for those of you who know him as Egyptian Minister of Antiquity. Um, this is me, a little bit younger, uh, meeting with Farouk Hosni, who was then the Minister of Culture, and uh, in, in Paris, we even gave him a copy uh, of our register that we had outside, which was the Mohel book, of which I showed you a copy before. Um, this is a, 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 a picture taken uh, with the culture minister, Mr. El Nam Nam here. Um, it shows Sami Ibrahim, I think he's on this Zoom, Roger Bilbul, my co-founder, myself, Andrew Baker, Magda Harun, uh, 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 and the um, uh, DC of the US Embassy in Cairo. This is a copy of the Iftar to which we invited Mr. Farouk Hosni uh, and uh, Mr. Kamel, who was then ambassador in Paris and then became ambassador in the UK. Farouk Hosni, the culture minister. And he is actually on record saying that we would have uh, access to these records. Um, unfortunately, uh, he was. we invited him to this Iftar because he was... He was willing to talk to us because he was uh, a candidate uh, to Secretary General for UNESCO. He failed, but then he failed us too. He never kept his promise on that. So we had high hopes and these hopes were uh, uh, shattered, unfortunately. Now, all along the American Jewish Committee, apart from supporting and helping us, um, was instrumental also in explaining to the US lawmakers the Jewish heritage question in Egypt. It had positive results because over the past 18 years, Egypt restored four main synagogues, listed three cemeteries in Alexandria as heritage sites, which we cleaned. And I know a group of Jews born in Cairo are doing the same at the moment with the help of Mr. Sami Ibrahim, who is on this Zoom. This obviously reflects Egypt's thirst for tourists. And I say anything for a buck, but nothing for the Jews. So in spite of Congresswoman Nita Lowy and Senator Ron Wyden's request for our records, Egypt still turns a disdainful deaf ear. So all in all, Egypt withholds religious identity in spite of property rights conferred by fees levied for the service. Egypt does not respect the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights voted by the UN General Assembly. They cannot invoke a law on the immovability of a copy of these documents, since the conditions under which these very documents came into the National Archives are suspicious, unfounded, and illegal. These are private identity documents that do not concern Egypt, but rabbinic authorities, and they have an ongoing practical use. Egypt has never impounded Christian, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Greek, or Armenian church documents. So I say that this is discriminatory. To conclude, I would note that severe consequences for our parents of the nationality laws, the expulsions, denaturalization, are now followed for the next generations by the difficulty to settle inheritance, define one's Judaism, or simply locate one's ancestor tombs, or even just find pride in one's past. We were forced to leave because of our identity, yet the proof of that identity is kept from us. I believe this adds insult to the injury of being thrown out of one's own country like dirt because of one's religion. We know that any recourse in an Egyptian court or an international court is bound to be tinted politically or remain without effect. So only common sense from goodwill people at the top level of the pyramid can right this wrong. So I've done enough quitting. Steve, thank you so much for an informative overview of the second goal of Sephardi Voices. 
because the first goal is to collect the story so you have the pride, the heritage that's passed on to the families that becomes part of an educational toolkit. So one also knows the Sephardi story, not the Ashkenazi story. But the second goal is the human rights story. There is no reason that the United Nations continually says there are Palestinian refugees and there are not Sephardi refugees. The United Nations addresses all kinds of refugees and displaced people around the world. There are horrible things happening today. But the identification of the displaced from the Islamic countries who are Jewish are not addressed. And this is, in fact, the goal, the second goal. It's a human rights goal. Yes, there are other refugees. Yes, there are other displaced. But why not the story of Arab Jews? Why not the story of Babylonian Jews? Why not the story of Egyptian Jews? And so I want to just uh, call out to two people who are part of our call today how much I am grateful to Alech Mali, who's the chair of Sephardi Voices UK, and of um, Lavana Zamir, who has done the most amazing job in terms of advocating for Egyptian Jewry in Israel um, and around the world. Both of these people, like you, Eve, are in the forefront in terms of addressing this human rights issue. So I want to ask you a question, Eve. What can we do who are listening? What can we do in terms of the people we know to help this cause? Well, I, I, um, I think this is basically a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think it's a question, obviously, of um, uh, talking about it again and again and again. You know, we've been talking about this now for 18 years. Um, we have not been able to reach or to confirm uh, or, to, or to address, the, uh, no, we've not been able to reach the top guy. And basically, I think everybody in Egypt is afraid of making a decision about this because uh, they, they, they don't know what, the, what the, the top echelon thinks. We've tried to, to, to address that, and we are not sure that our voice is being heard by them. The only voices that they hear are voices of American senators and congressmen. This, these are the voices that they take on very seriously. And I think they take it on because obviously there is an appropriation committee that decides on funds that relate to Egypt. Um, I think that any help that can come by convincing congressmen or senators to take this problem up with uh, the, the, the Egyptian ambassador in the US or with the Egyptian government in, in, uh, in Cairo is obviously welcome. Um, again, I don't, you know, we can make a lot of noise about this, but it won't help. It's, it's, it's basically a, a, a fundamental decision that has to be taken by uh, the top man. Uh, they've made all sorts of promises. They've said that they were digitizing the records uh, and you know, they've now had the records for four years. We worked out with specialists in Egypt that this digitization can be done in three months. It's now four years. They've not digitized anything. We don't even, we, nobody has been able to see the records that they have seized. We don't even know whether these records still exist. The, 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 the culture minister, to tell you, to give you the, the, the frame of mind, the culture minister, Mr. Nannan, when we met him, um, he said, but you must understand, there is blood between us. There was no blood between Jews in Egypt and, and Egyptians. There was no blood. So, I mean, they're, they're constantly confusing the, 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 the notion of Judaism and, uh, and, and Zionism, that, that is a, a, a major handicap. And they're afraid that anything they will do for the Jews, that this will reflect on how they're supposed to be thinking about Israel and Zionism. They have done a tremendous amount of work because of the sen senatorial influence on the restoration of synagogues. 
The latest thing was a major uh, restoration which took place in Alexandria. Now, we've been working, we've been lobbying for the restoration of the synagogue in Alexandria since 2008, 2009, with Mr. Farouk Hosni. This, when he wanted to be um, uh, cultural minister, when he wanted to be secretary general, um, they started, they made a study, a six months study. They made, everything was speak and span. They were going to start the, the, the restoration. They put up the scaffolding by the synagogue. The scaffolding stayed in place for seven years, six years. And no work had been, had, was done on, on it because he wasn't elected. But once they got another, push by the American senators, they went ahead and they did a fantastic job at rest restoring these synagogues. A fantastic job. And yet, they ignored the Jews because they made a restoration. They, they, they inaugurated the, the, the synagogue in, in January uh, 2019. There was no single Jew from abroad invited. No one of the authorities, and there were hundreds and hundreds of people and cameramen and everything. Not a single person was, wo was uh, wearing a kippah. Imagine going into a mosque in any country in the world with your shoes on and see what happens to you. Not a single person was wearing a kippah. There was not a single prayer. And that's why we insisted on trying to do something and we were able to go with 180 people to Alexandria in February and hold services there. And we were very happy to do so. And we were very happy that the government allowed us to do so. You must also remember that they, are, they have protected all the Jewish sites in the sense that there have been practically no Jews. And throughout uh, the, the years that have gone by with revolutions and, and uh, uh, uprisings and so on, no synagogue has been harmed. No synagogue has been harmed. The worst that has happened, and, and it's very bad, was the encroaching and, and uh, cannibalizing of the synagogue in Cairo. But the synagogues, the, of the cemeteries in Cairo, but the cemeteries in Alexandria have been protected. So I think, just to answer the question, the, 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 the best uh, help is to talk to whoever has power to transmit a voice to a, a, a top echelon in Egypt. I think that they mean well, they mean well, that the, the Egyptian government is not, uh, uh, is not aggressively against its Jews. Uh, they mean well. They just don't want to be seen uh, uh, to be doing anything for Jews outside. I mean, there's a question, of, for instance, of the Sifre Torah. There are 130, 150 Sifre Torah in Egypt. There are five Jews left. Now, what do they do with the Sifre Torah? The, the, the theory is that anything which is over 100 years old is an antiquity and therefore cannot leave Egypt. Fine, that's fine. But we worked with the Egyptian uh, uh, antiquities uh, people and uh, Mr. Sami Ibrahim, and we found out that there were at least 30 or 40 Sifre Torah which were in good condition, able to be recycled, and under 100 years old. So why not lend them to communities across the world? Anything which is in Egypt that concerns the history of Jews in Egypt, and remember, Jews are the oldest monotheistic religion in Egypt. They come before Christianity, they come before Islam. It's the oldest monotheistic religion in Egypt. Anything that has to do with the history of Jews in Egypt, they will protect in Egypt but they won't give you anything outside. I don't know why. There is nothing in these records which, is, which can conflict with the Egyptian government. There is nothing in these records which, is, uh, which pertains to claims that could be made to the Egyptian government. And even claims that would, if you want to make a claim to the Egyptian government, you go to the, to the, to, to the uh, Segel El Arkari, which is the, the, where they have land registration documents, and that's freely available. Anybody can go there and you will see that this building belonged to Mr. Cohen, and now it belongs to whoever it is, and nobody knows how the, 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 the property was transferred, but it was transferred. Material claims can be made without these registers. These registers are absolutely useless for material claims. 
And material claims have been brought in front of Egyptian courts and have been won in front of Egyptian courts. So I think it's just a question of being able to make people understand that there is nothing in these records which is harmful to Egypt. And it is, on the contrary, very positive for Egypt to give us these records because it will, it will reflect on the Egyptian uh, openness and, and attitude today, uh, uh, which otherwise, you know, we can only complain about. So let me um, uh, just quickly summarize here. The situation in Egypt is not that different than, for example, the situation in Iraq. There's Iraqi Jewish, um, Iraqi Jewish archives that were found uh, um, in the war with Iraq that were brought back. And, and people like uh, Carol Bassery, people like uh, Gina Waldman of Jumena have played a very strong role, Stan Ehrman, in terms of trying to keep these records in the United States um, because the Iraqi government wants it back. And yet there's so much that is uh, in Iraq uh, that is um, being held and not available. And, and people like Edwin Shuker are playing a very big role in trying to uh, get access to this. And so my comment is very simple. Anyone who is listening, the way we are able, in fact, to get some traction on any of these issues is by you sharing the story, by you sharing your own story, by you bringing it into the educational system so that it is part of Jewish education. We need to nourish the younger generation as well as have the older generation be able to address it. And over time, I do believe this will happen because what Eve and Alain and Juliet are talking about is a, in Hebrew you'd say, a gesher v'kesher. It's a bridge and a connection because it is part of their heritage. They breathe it. They are an Egyptian Jew. They understand it. They have the connections. And we have limited time. These people left in 1956, they left earlier. And we need them to lead us. And we need the people who are listening to share the message. So I just, um, we're a bit over time here and I want Yoram to, to end. So I just want to thank Juliet for her personal story. I want to thank Alain for sharing the history of his family and Egyptian Jewry and the role of the Karaites. And I want to thank Eve for bringing it in within the context of a human rights story, showing us that the ketuvot, the, 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 uh, the marriage contracts, the death records, talking about how there is a willingness, but when it comes to actualization, it does not happen. And I think that if we um, reach out to Eve, or we reach out to Alan, or we reach out to Juliet, they can help us in this process. So thank you all.